Hi there, my name is Levi Sterrett, and this morning I'd like to present my submission to the 2024 Chess Modeling Bot Challenge. First, I'd like to discuss um, the strategy of playing chess in general. For a lot of people in this conference, um, maybe unfamiliar with the general strategy of chess, maybe know just how to move the pieces, but have never thought any deeper about the strategy. Then I want to discuss the principles of how chess engines play and how that's different from human players. And finally, I want to present my implementation, discuss some of the challenges I faced, present some results I, I gleaned, and uh, continue to discuss that. So first, to sum up the general strategy of playing the game of chess, if I had to sum it up in a couple words, I would say don't screw up. Chess is a game where with perfect play, every game should end in a draw perfect play from both sides. The goal for each move or each turn of the game is to pick the legal move that reduces your chances of winning the least. In other words, it's impossible to choose a move that increases your chances of winning. You can only choose a move that's least damaging to your position or maintains your current position. Because chess is such a massive game with a, such a massive possibilities um, of positions, it's impossible to foresee everything. So you have to pick moves that force your opponent into situations with no good moves or moves that are exceptionally difficult to find. And it should be noted that chess is such a large game that even computers cannot possibly see all of the possible moves. One basic strategy point is that if you are ahead in material, that is to say you have more pieces or more valuable pieces than your opponent, you want to trade down pieces and simplify the game, get as many pieces off the board as possible to accentuate um, your advantage. On the other hand, if you're down in material and your opponent has an advantage, um, you want to keep the moves or you want to keep as many pieces on the board as possible to complicate the game and increase the chances that your opponent will make a mistake. Um, in, when humans play chess, there's two major strategies, tactical and positional strategy. Tactical play is based on playing moves that either trap your opponent um, or put them into a position where good moves are hard to find or there are no good moves. An example is something called a pin. So you can see in this um, diagram here, the, the white bishop is seeing the king through this knight. So although it appears that the knight is defending the black bishop, the queen can attack the black bishop and the knight is unable to recapture the queen because of this pin. So a pin can, can cause the situation where it appears that the black knight is protecting that bishop, but in fact it isn't because of the pin. So that would be an example of a tactical situation. Positional play, on the other hand, is playing moves which generally set the pieces up for future opportunities in good positions. Um, examples of this would be castling. If you castle the king and the rook, you often put your king into a more safe position which is more difficult to attack. Or another one would be, another principle of good play would be developing your pieces. In other words, bringing your pieces off of the back rank and into play where they're more able to get into the game um, in defense or in attacks um, later in the game. Good human players can play both ways and do play both ways in any given game, but oftentimes human players have a style that they prefer more. There's um, uh, also opening preparation in human play. So top level um, humans and bot players memorize a set of m opening sequences. Um, even in top level play, achieving a winning advantage this way by memorizing moves is not very realistic because there's just too many moves to memorize. However, the goal is to get the other player into a situation that they are less comfortable in or less familiar than with you. So if you can get your player uncomfortable, um, that's the goal of opening preparation. End games are also another part of uh, the game where we where um, top level human players study, um, and it's because the reduced number of pieces allow uh, more analysis to be done, a more complete analysis to be done. In fact, um, databases contain all of the end game positions with seven or fewer pieces on the board, and so we know for sure who's going to who's uh, theoretically got the ability to win. 
um, lose or draw in, in positions with seven or fewer players on the board, or seven or fewer pieces, excuse me. So the top level human players memorize these patterns. Um, they don't memorize all of the specific positions, but they memorize repeatable patterns um, and sequences to win common endgames. An example would be the king and queen versus king endgame, something that would be very easy for a practiced player to win, but is surprisingly difficult um, for a human player, or so, sorry, not for a human player, for a novice player. So chess engines um, play a little bit differently, but in the same way they focus on four major sections of the game. Um, opening book, so a set of pre-programmed opening sequences. End game table base, which just refers to, um, like I mentioned before, at the end when there's a fewer number of pieces on the board, um, a database can hold the correct moves. Uh, but the two that I want to talk about today are evaluation, which uh, basically talks about, given a current position, what is the likely out outcome of the game. Um, this is measured in what's called centipawns, and a centipawn can be thought of as one hundredth of a pawn's worth of advantage. So if you have an evaluation of 100, that would mean that the uh, white player has the equivalent of one additional pawn's worth of advantage. A positive number means an advantage for white, and a negative number means an advantage for black. Um, based on heuristics such as material count, so how many pieces are on the board, um, space advantage, um, how able to move are the pieces, um, piece activity, which is similar to um, space advantage, king safety, which discusses uh, how difficult it is or how easy it is to attack the king or check the king. And these are the things that go into evaluation. And again, evaluation is not about looking ahead. Evaluation is about looking at a single position and deciding who's winning in this position. The final um, area of chess engine strategy is search. So in general, um, a chess game can be viewed as a graph where positions are nodes in the graph and moves are edges which lead to different positions. And the goal for a chess engine is to look ahead through this graph and traverse this graph to future positions and evaluate those future positions and decide uh, which move should I play now to lead to a more favorable future position. All those evaluations are propagated back to the current position. So if I look ahead five moves and I see that the best position I can get into has a certain evaluation, then I can consider that evaluation to be the evaluation of my current position because I'm leading in that direction. And the key to achieving a deeper search and therefore a better evaluation um, is by searching efficiently. So the search is the area in my implementation that I spent the most time. And I think that this part is the most interesting uh, because it's the least human, uh, in my opinion. And I'll give an example of that um, here in a moment. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about this search, and I want to talk about something called Minimax. And I'm going to use this example here. So consider the evaluation of this position. Um, there's no pieces that have been captured yet, so the evaluation is zero because they have all the pieces on the board. In a search of depth one, so say an engine is evaluating the position for white and it's searching forward a depth of one move, white will evaluate all the positions and realize that the only position that provides an advantage is by taking the pawn on d5, knight d5 and the new evaluation, the evaluation will be 100 because white has one more pawn than black. Now for a human player, um, it's obvious that taking that pawn on d5 will result in immediate recapture of the knight and 100 minus 300, 300 being the relative um, um, value of a knight compared to the pawns, would result in a negative evaluation of 200. So now black has an advantage. And this is very obvious to a human player that if you take that pawn, the, the other pawn is going to immediately take the knight and that's not something that you want to do. But for a chess engine, it's much more difficult to see quote unquote obvious moves like that. 
So in a search of depth two, uh, we can not only see that we'll receive an advantage from taking the pawn as white, but then we'll have a negative advantage when black recaptures. So the point of this is that in odd depths, so the first one we look for good evaluations and that's the path that we take. But when black recaptures, we're looking for the best move for black. So we're looking for the least evaluation, so the most negative evaluation. And that's why this is called the mini-max search, because alternating moves, um, we look for the maximum evaluation followed by the minimum evaluation and so on every time we go um, back and forth switching between um, the player's turns. So um, to generalize what we're doing here, we're doing a depth first search. So we'll pick a depth that we want to search to and then we will search all the way down to a final move um, in a depth first manner. And then we will take the evaluation from that point and propagate back up. So we're recursively searching down. We start at the root, we search one move and then a move from there and then a move from there. And as we propagate back up, we're comparing the evaluations of the final states of this search tree um, to see which move is the best move. Um, this is an extremely difficult task. There's probably somewhere between um, five to 20 legal moves in each position. And so if you think of this as an exponential growth problem, we're talking like 10 to 15 raised to the n uh, and so it very quickly becomes out of hand. So we need to prune large chunks of this tree away if we want to get any reasonable depth. And we can do this um, using a technique that I will show you in a moment. Evaluation order here matters, the moves that you evaluate. So we typically um, search the best moves first. And in my implementation, I first evaluated checks. So checks on the king, followed by capturing moves followed by attacking moves, and then all of the other moves afterwards. And I'll explain why evaluation order matters here in a moment as well. So let's look at this pruning example, and we're continuing the example from the previous slide, and we're supposing that the white knight naively took that pawn, um, knowing, or it was unaware that it was going to get recaptured by the queen or the pawn. And now we're in the position of black evaluating the next move. So black starts by evaluating this pawn. And obviously this is not the, the best move because it's not recapturing the knight, but the chess engine doesn't know that yet. So it evaluates this move a6. So the a pawn is moving to the sixth rank. And this is not the best move, but it doesn't result in anything getting captured. And so the evaluation from the current position of 100 stays at 100 because black is still down one pawn. Okay, then imagine um, black evaluates the move bishop to a3. So it's moving the bishop all the way over here. Again, this is the same evaluation of 100, but at a depth 2, we would evaluate that the pawn, the b pawn, can take that bishop and result in an evaluation of negative 200. So this is a bad result for black, and in fact, it's such a bad result that we don't even need to evaluate any other follow-up moves from white after bishop takes a3 because um, we've already found that this is worse than what if we wouldn't have moved anything. For example, if we moved to this a pawn and we resulted in an evaluation of 100. And so we can immediately throw out any follow-up moves from white after bishop to a3 because we know that that's going to result in the bishop being lost. So any legal moves that would follow bishop a3 we don't have to evaluate, we don't have to traverse that part of the tree. And so we can prune that away and save ourselves some time. And that's basically how the pruning works. And because of this it, it is extremely important that we look at the best moves first or what we think the best moves are first are going to be. Um, because that allows us to prune away more of the tree. If we start with the bad moves, then we'll incrementally improve the evaluation as we go. If we start with the best move, then anything else we can quickly rule out because it's going to be worse than what our current best is, if that makes any sense. 
Okay, so now I want to look at my implementation of these concepts. So this is the class diagram from my modeled implementation. Um, these classes here in the top right represent the, um, the tree structure. So a position is the node in the, in the tree, and a move is, a, um, is an edge. And so we have this reflexive associative relationship with the move um, acting as the edge. And all of these are related to the active game. These three classes here are the evaluation cap classes. So an evaluation engine has a state machine that, that kind of handles all of the coordination of evaluation with the, the flow of the game. Evaluation jobs are created and handled in order. Um, we will discuss that as well later in the, um, in the next slide when we talk about the state machine here. And um, evaluation order um, is captured by this class evaluation order with this reflexive association here. So again, we can control the order in which moves are evaluated based on their potential to be good moves or bad moves. And then R8 captures a stack for the rec recursive search, which we'll look at next. Okay, so this is the state machine for the evaluation job. Um, class. So evaluation jobs are created for each position and they start at the root of the current position for the game. And the first thing that happens is we co start collecting moves. So we look at what legal moves are available um, and we also consider the depth that we want to search. If there's no legal moves or if we're already at the depth that we want to search we just go straight to done and end our evaluation job. If we do have um, moves to evaluate, we put them into the correct order, and then we start by evaluating a move. In this center state here, we create a new evaluation job and put it onto the stack. And then as that job completes, it comes back and updates our current evaluation. That's where we're propagating that evaluation back to the root. And then once we've evaluated all of the moves at this level, we finalize our evaluation. And this finalizing step contains other things like checking for checkmates and stalemates and other types of um, edge conditions. And then once we're done, we pop off the stack and we notify the previous evaluation job that it can continue. So I have a little animation for this um, to help understand. Um, so here's an example where I start with a position and then I've got um, two um, moves that can follow this first position. So two new positions, and then two legal moves from each of those positions to create four. So the first position would go on the stack as an evaluation job. It would collect these two moves, two and three, and it would evaluate uh, move two. Move two would collect its two moves, four and five, and it would evaluate move four. When move four was completed evaluating, it would pop off the stack and update the evaluation for, for position two. And then we would evaluate position five, um, when position five is complete, we'd pop off the stack and update um, position two. It also should be noted that if we were able to prune, we may never even have to evaluate position five. We might just skip to done at that point. So now two has been evaluated. We pop off the stack and update position one. And now position one can evaluate position three. And position three itself evaluates six, evaluates seven, and itself pops off the stack and we finalize the evaluation for position one. So the, the major challenges that I ran into um, in this implementation, um, search was the focus, but evaluation had to improve in step with search. Um, so the pruning technique that I described really depends on there being differences in evaluations between the two positions or between the, the set of uh, possible moves. Because if they're not different, if they all have the same evaluation, um, then I, I can't really rule anything out. So the more simplistic my evaluation was, the more difficult it was to prune away um, bad positions. So I started off with just simply counting up the piece values and using the material count as my evaluation, but that turned out to be a little bit too simple. So I added um, king safety, pawn advancement, so allowing pawns to um, get a bonus for being close to the end of the board. And that also allowed in the end game for um, queens to become, um, 
um, to be made and to, to win the game. And I also included a little bit of random noise that allowed there to be fewer identical evaluations, which, which helped the efficiency of the prune step. Um, performance was also an issue early on. Um, I actually got to the point in my um, implementation that I was no longer able to run it in Model Verifier. So early on, I was testing and running in Model Verifier, but as I got further into this, um, I got to the point where I was unable to run in Model Verifier. So I was compiling to Java with Sierra and, um, and building that and running that. And I did find an issue with Sierra related to relate and unrelate that was causing some performance problems. But after resolving that, I was able to run with a depth of um, four comfortably. Um, I did run a few times to a depth of five, um, but that oftentimes ran into memory issues and I was never able to run six or more in depth. Uh, memory efficiency ended up being the main bottleneck and the main limiting factor. Um, I would routinely increase up to several gigabytes of memory being used um, and that seemed to be the issue with going deeper in our search. The MC3020 uh, implementation, I did port this to C with MC3020 and it works rather well. Um, I was hoping to see improved performance with that but um, it also ran into the same uh, memory limits. And so um, it was about the same as Java. Um, and in fact, because this is an exponential problem, it wasn't even able to uh, perform much better um, in terms of memory. And so it was still working at a depth of four comfortably. The results I had, um, I achieved about a 1500 rapid rating on leechess.org, which was enough to beat the Maya one um, bot that's available there. Um, it can beat me almost every time, um, but not a better player than me. So I'm sure that there are plenty of human players out there that could beat this bot. Um, it does punish blunders very quickly. So if you leave a piece unprotected, it will immediately take that piece. And it does not miss any unprotected pieces. If you're interested in looking into it more, um, I've linked here a few of the games that it's played against Maya 1 that are interesting to look into in more depth. Um, this animated GIF here is one of those um, games, and you can find that link as well. I also want to talk about some of the statistics. So this is the Java implementation at a depth of four. Um, uh, and at each time the analysis loop ran, um, I collected data. So current positions, in other words, the instance population of active positions in the graph, um, was on average about 200,000 positions in memory at once. And then as the game progresses, the, the positions that were not taken were pruned away. Um, minimum was 2,133. So that would be in a situation where there's very few legal moves, like maybe near the end of the game. And the max is 1.8 million. So you can kind of see from this... Um, from this graph here at the top, this is current positions in blue and newly evaluated positions um, in the current analysis cycle in red. And you can see at the beginning of a game, there's a lot of ambiguity on, um, or there's a lot of options on positions that you can achieve. And as the game goes on, um, that reduces as um, there's fewer and fewer good positions to play. Uh, and the analysis time, um, statistics kind of follow the number of positions. So the average time for a move um, in analysis was 4.3 seconds. Um, at the minimum we did in 7 milliseconds and the maximum was close to 50 seconds near the beginning. Um, the total positions evaluated over the course of the game increased quickly at the beginning and then leveled off a little bit and increased at the end as well and um, got up to about 7 million moves evaluated through the course of this game. Thank you for all who participated in this, uh, in this challenge. Thank you for listening to my presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, I've also um, linked the source code for my implementation, as well as the analysis data I used in this presentation. And if you'd like to challenge my bot, it's available on leechest.org. Thank you.